socially connected series um, and uh, a mini series within that. We've been uh, meeting the PD Avengers, the founding members. And today we're so excited to be meeting two more Avengers. It seems everyone we meet with, it just adds another layer of um, inspiration and passion. So, um, so excited to, uh, to meet our two guests today. Um, before I turn it over to you, Dr. Subramanian, our host, I'll just uh, again welcome everyone on behalf of PMD Alliance. My name is Andrea, and I'm so excited to, as always, work with uh, Dr. Indu Subramanian. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Indu, and let you um, uh, introduce our guests. Sure. So it's a great pleasure to continue this series. I mean, I wish we could all be together physically, but we're still physically uh, distant, sadly, but socially connecting, which is really important, um, and uh, virtually connecting here. And we, we have literally a global connection that's forming. Um, we continue the energy and uh, advocacy and activism. Um, it's just been kind of a, a it's, it's, it'll be a marathon, but we've been sprinting recently through the Movement Disorders Society meeting. Uh, we had the... Um, and Endel Institute uh, offerings last week with rallying with Parkinson's disease um, stuff, the Avengers presented there and um, wanted to continue to highlight uh, some of the founding members of the Avengers. Um, thanks uh, so much to the PMD Alliance for continuing to host this and uh, get a platform uh, where we can speak openly about these issues. Um, so today we have some Avengers um, that are coming to us from the UK, um, some really spectacular ladies over there who just are really um, fighting the fight, uh, rallying together, doing a lot of collaboration, connection, so many great things. So we, we wanted to share their stories. Um, and really the theme today is that, that Parkinson's is not just about the person living with Parkinson's, but the people that are also caring about them, um, not just uh, us as the physicians or providers that are out there, but really the family members and the community that supports um, our patients no matter where they are. So, um, so today we'll introduce you to Sally Bromley, um, who uh, is uh, the chair of the Oxford branch of Parkinson's UK. She's a pretty cool lady. Um, I was watching some of her um, story and I think we'll be highlighting um, a few things with a couple of videos. And then Jane Calder will speak to us um, just a little bit later on, and then we'll take some question and answer for both ladies. So, um, so as I mentioned, Sally is the chair of the Oxford branch of the Parkinson UK. Um, she is a teacher, a mother, grandmother, uh, so many things, a wife. Um, and she's really done a lot to try to help um, bring patients and make them sort of teach each other. I think that's really kind of a cool way of um, you know, highlighting so much of her work. She um, has about, uh, she has a few different programs that she'll teach us about, but maybe first, um, Sally, we'll just hear from you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your journey um, with uh, Parkinson's when, when you got diagnosed and a little bit about how maybe you got connected uh, with the Avengers. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, <coughs> evening here in, in the UK. <clears throat> Uh, I was diagnosed when I was 59 years old, and that was 12 years ago. It makes me nearly, I'm just coming up to 72 now. And um, I thought I was jolly young, and I didn't, didn't uh, you know, I, I didn't like the idea at all. <clears throat> but I had, uh, I had spent a lot of my career working with primary age children, and more lately, lately in, uh, in middle schools, which is up to 13 years old. And I had great fun, I really enjoyed it. But then the school system changed here in Oxford. And so I had to take a different job. And the job I took was the head of, in, I was in charge of the sex and relationships education. I don't think you knew that, did you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the sex and relationships education. And I was responsible for, for delivering a, a full program to the whole of Oxfordshire young people. So that was quite interesting, you know, I suppose you could say had condoms will travel, but you know, there we go. And uh, I was enjoying doing that. And I was, I'd had this little tremor in my hand, went to the doctors who said, oh, I think it's essential to us, I ought to send you to the doctors, to the specialists. So I went along and was diagnosed, convinced I had got Parkinson's, but when I eventually said, you've got Parkinson's, I just burst out crying. And um, just thought, where, where do I go? Nothing. All I was guided towards was a bit of exercise, to do some exercise, a medication. There was nothing else really available. 
Hence, you know, a bit later, further down the line, I, I wrote the first steps program for newly diagnosed. So it was a bit of a shock having the diagnosis. Shake up from the family as well. Yeah, absolutely. So teach us a little bit about what led you to do the first steps program and maybe we can show the video as well. We have a video of, of you in the first steps. Would it be better to show the video first and then talk after or whatever you'd like? It doesn't matter. Take okay. your pick. Okay. Andrea, why don't you show the video? Because I think it's really cute. Hearing a diagnosis of Parkinson's, which is a chronic, complex condition, is kind of devastating. And I suppose I was searching for some form of, of solace for this, but there was none. Then I was approached by somebody locally who I had never met before to produce a program for people at the point of diagnosis. It's a two-day program for helping people to come to terms with their condition cope with it, how to deal with it, how to deal with it with work, with the family, and the importance of certain things like exercise particularly. It includes nutrition and daily living help. The interesting thing about First Steps is it was written by people with Parkinson's, has been tested on and evaluated by people with Parkinson's. So it has great validity and credibility. But something that I've been frustrated by is the lack of evaluation of it that has been consistent and I wanted quantitative evidence. Now Brooks has taken that on and I'm so pleased. The First Steps programme is funded by Parkinson's UK, so we're able to roll it out to all branches throughout the country. And there are 365 branches, so there's plenty of networks we can, we can tap into. So hopefully by the end of three years, everybody in the country will have had an opportunity to have um, experienced the First Steps programme and no, it's really, it's really successful because of the evaluation that Brooks University is doing. That's amazing. So you kind of took an experience in which you yourself had been kind of shocked by this diagnosis and turned it into something to help others sort of through your own experience. So what does the First Steps um, experience include? Well, it, it includes, it tells you what Parkinson's is and what it isn't. And uh, we were guided by Alex Reed, who leads the European Parkinson's Disease Centre in Northern Italy. <clears throat> and we, by working with him, we sort of decided how we were going to structure the program over two days. And, you know, with a delicious lunch at one of, you know, one of the days, you know, it, it, it's important to make people feel welcome and cherished in a way. So uh, it, it, it it really is to sort of educate people to realize what it is, what you're dealing with. And that, you know, when people say to you, um, oh, I, I just can't go to a group because I don't want to see people, how people end up, you know. And I said, well, this is the beginning of your journey. Here is the end of your journey. You've got all that bit in the middle. And if you only look at that bit there, that's the bit you're going to get to very, very quickly. So by having, a, letting, letting people see, that really it is important to have, um, fill, your, fill your life productively and enjoyably as well. And uh, so that, that's how it came about, but it was really with the, the guidance of Alex Reed and his, his pro progress at the European Parkinson's Therapy Center. That's amazing. Have you been able to continue this through um, the COVID situation? Have you had it online or anything? Or? Yes, the bad, yes. It's, it's, it, well, it, it hadn't been online, this has now gone um, it's now being, instead of having two, uh, two days workshop, that's much too long to do a Zoom thing. It's now over four days, but it's now being done virtually. So I'm really, really pleased about that. And we, we, we put it together really quickly. In about three months, we, we put the whole thing together. Ever since then, it just, it just gets slower and slower. But, um, but it, it has meant that, um, now oh, nearly 700 people have now been through and succeeded with with this and what it's meant is, is i've now got because it started off in oxfordshire and the membership of, the, of my group has sort of gone up and the the fear that people come to 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 to, to parkinson's is all eradicated well i've got parkinson's 
so what? And, you know, and I think that's, that's a, 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 you know, a, a great accolade, really, to, to have someone say that to you. Well, that's amazing. So it sounds like you yourself transformed at some point. You kind of had this thing, you were sort of devastated at the beginning with the diagnosis. Um, I think I watched a different video where you talk about sort of that first feeling when you first got it. And then you sort of use that energy, which I think is a theme of many of the Avengers, to sort of pivot and then use it in a way. Uh, and I'll just, um, you know, find some things that I noted um, from some of the work that you've been doing. One of the things that you work on, and we can talk individually about this, is translating research findings um, from, you know, research scientists into language that patients can understand. Um, another part of your work is uh, teaching students about Parkinson's disease, I guess, at schools and things like that, really engaging the community to understand more about the disease um, and the people living with it. Um, and then you really wanted to be a bridge between the patients and the research. So sort of, um, I guess, using your ways to connect people maybe that you learned perhaps as a teacher um, to kind of teach and, and kind of um, advocate and, and empower people. Um, and then another thing was about patient-led initiatives. And so really wanting to use patients to kind of be part of the solution. So um, where did all that kind of energy and the pivot come from for you, do you think? Well, I soon realized, I, I, mean, I happen to be quite positive anyway, but uh, I soon realized that I couldn't just dolefully go through life thinking, every time I woke up thinking, hmm, I've got Parkinson's, and go to bed at night thinking the same thing because it, is, it does very easily become like that. Um, but I, I was absolutely determined it wasn't going to be like that. So I joined the group. When I joined the group, I was the youngest by a long way. And uh, I was thinking, oh, what am I going to do? I just thought I've got to stick this out. And then I thought, I'll do a skydive. This is the person who gets terrified walking up a church tower. <laughs> my, my, my children said, mom, are you sure you know what you're doing? But I did a skydive, and that was like a, a catalyst. It was, it was just amazing. You know, you, you sailing through the air, and I just, I've had enough looking this way. And he said, do you want to spin? I said, I want to spin. And we spun down. It was <laughs> an amazing experience. I, I, and I would never, ever have done it if I hadn't got Parkinson's, because I would have been too chicken. I would have been too scared. But I did. And I, that, that was like a turning point because when I was at doing this, this, this jump, there were a lot of other people jumping for Parkinson's as well. And um, sorry, I'm really juddery down here. My, my legs, I'm afraid. You're getting and, excited about the memories of your twirling around in the air. Yeah, with the, the, around, yeah. <laughs> the, the lovely little puppy and holding on to me. Um, it was, um, so I was talking to other people about what they did. And I think and that was quite inspiring. And I do think um, it, it is important to talk about your condition with people with it. If I talked about my condition with all my neighbours, I wouldn't have very many friends left, I don't think, because they don't understand. Does that, does that sort of kind of make it clear? But yeah, I mean, I think you yeah. kind of just had to really, it sounds like shake it up. 100% and then kind of realign that energy and move forward, it sounds That's like. That's right. So, and then, then getting people to sort of talk in lay language is not so easy, you know, especially when you go to, to um, some of the things that go on here in Oxford. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, there's a lot of research going on. And so I say, to them, would you like to come and talk about your research? But you've got to make it easy for us. You've got to make it clear for us. And so these students who haven't maybe had a chance to meet anybody with Parkinson's. They're dealing with Parkinson's in their Petri dishes or whatever. And uh, suddenly they're, they're, they're face to face with real people with a condition. And they just say, I had such a wonderful time. And very often a lot of them come back and you know, spend time with us. It's lovely. So you're literally, as patients, meeting, is it medical students or are they researchers in labs? The, the expert patients. Yeah. yeah, maybe teach us a little bit about that expert, because somebody has written about that. Jonathan in the chat has written, Sally is very active in an initiative to involve patients in helping to educate medical students, That's medical right. school students, expert patient tutor program at Oxford University Hospitals. That's right. It's a, and this is the year five for, for um, students who ha are, are addressing neurology for the first time. Um, it became known to uh, Gabe DeLuca, who leads on this at the hospital 
that there's a lot of neurophobia. People are scared about the, dealing with anything to do with the brain. And so he's in, introduced this, this idea of having uh, tu tutors coming in and they are the patients. And, you know, I was sitting there, I had four students in front of me, then another four, and then another four. And it went on and I said, well, God, this is boring. You know, I was saying the same old thing. I said, and I finally said, look, you're testing me for these particular um, limitations in my, uh, in my movement, but that's not what bugs me. What bugs me is I can't turn over in bed. It bugs me that I, can't, I can peel a potato, but I can't turn it in my left hand for dexterity. So it bugs me that I can no longer have a singing voice. And then suddenly they, they, also went, oh, they really were interested in that. And between um, this, this tutor and myself and the, another friend, we've rewritten the, com the curriculum for neurology for the year five students. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think the patient-centered aspect of it and then partnering directly with people is just really such a, a kind of, in some ways, out of the box. Because I know when, when I was a medical student, I didn't get to meet real patients until third or fourth year. And you already kind of knew where you were going to be and kind of, a, you know, crossed off 7,000 things on your list. But I think meeting someone like you relatively on could be quite inspiring, I think. Yeah. So that's really and, amazing. And they, they also would say to me sometimes that, is there any way I could have improved this? And I just said, well, you know, it's, it's where they, when you're sitting down and they're standing up, you feel overpowered by this person. And so they're, they're learning the patient approach, the, 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 the approach for, for a patient as well. And it's, it's really interesting. I, I love doing it. That's amazing. And you're able to kind of give them feedback. It sounds like you, you felt oh, yeah. with them standing over you. So you're just teaching them. Absolutely. Sort of the art and the science of medicine, which unfortunately has been lost a little bit. So, so important. I felt my, the rigidity in my hand. I said, no, you didn't feel it. I know you didn't feel it. Try again. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's lovely. And I, I really do enjoy it. So are those the main students that you're teaching as the medical students? Or are there also yeah, other kids? Medical well? students, and I've also taught. And they've now introduced uh, a, a, like a startup of, of year four students there. But I also go every year to, to give a, a talk to 120 pharmacy students at Reading University. And that's again, and you know, you, if you just do something a bit different, you know, I have an activity that I do and they think it's just whizzy, you know, it's, it's very simple. Really. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, Gloria's written half the things on the UPD, it's the UPDRS, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale or whatever the scale is, I don't give a fig about. Um, but my doctor goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the outcomes, I think that's one of the things we're highlighting is that a lot of the outcomes that we've been taught to look for, which is really just measuring these motor things, is that's really right. not what makes so much of a difference to our patients and really sort of rethinking it, I think is really key. So, yeah. so that's amazing. Um, you've also been pretty key with um, introducing some new things, uh, Sally, at the Oxford branch of the Parkinson's UK. I noticed that you guys are doing some mindfulness. I was poking around on your website. Um, you've also been doing some dance with Parkinson's, um, all kinds of things. Maybe we'll just show your partnership uh, with the dance uh, uh, video. Is that okay? Certainly, yeah. There's a certain element of disbelief that ballet would be for somebody who's perhaps shaky or perhaps stiff or perhaps unsteady. You walk into that room and Kate just smiles at you. She's got the widest smile in the world. They make it fun as well. Normally we just giggle and giggle and giggle. It's bringing people together with a common interest, a common outcome. That is what binds people. You don't think of Parkinson's, you just think of everything else. Everybody in it together to, to help and to, to socialize and, and enjoy themselves. I love that. I've seen it like three times. I love the two guys that are at the, at the end there, just kind of looking around and being like, what are we supposed to do in this class? So cute, it, it, very yeah, cute. It's, it's, it is very, it's absolutely adorable. And um, this is all led by English National Ballet based on some work that's been done in New York. It's really fun, it's interesting, and it's, it's music. It's music is just so special. And we have our, our own pianist there, and she's very, very good. And so we do a bit of voice exercise as well. And it, it, it's a joy, absolute joy.
but we, we just started doing uh, this term. We only started today uh, for this term to to, um, to work on Midsummer Night's Dream. There you go. In ballet? Don't, don't, <laughs> yes, don't, don't ask me any details because I've got to wait and see what happens. Okay. But it's, yes, it's, it's, it's really, you just think, you're, just, you're out of yourself. You're no longer a person with Parkinson's. You're just there. It doesn't matter that you can't do what they're doing. What matters is you're just, you're there. It's in the moment. And, and I think these in the moments have got to be cherished. So how much do you think it matters? Because I saw a whole list of offerings of your center there. Um, how much does it matter what you're doing? Like, do you think it's more just about getting together with other people and socially connecting or what's your sense of that? To be absolutely honest with you, social interaction, I think is so important. And that is what is lacking at the moment. You know, we can't have that handy, you know, just walk across the room and chat with somebody. Um, you know, a cup and a biscuit is really, really important, you know, especially a Jaffa cake, but don't tell anybody. It's our little secret. Um, but it's, it's um, that's the most important thing. But everything else becomes incidental, but it's also extremely useful. So we have, uh, we started this mindfulness class, and that's been going on throughout COVID and has just been very, very um therapeutic for a lot of people uh the other th you know we have a, a speaker at, at our meetings but then in august we have a special time and we have a discussion group and um, we we have a theme and we discuss it as in in small groups and then uh we assess well, not really assess we evaluate what the the result the responses have been and then um and then the following month we have some specialist come and talk to us about it this, this last August, we still had it virtually, which was quite, quite novel for a lot of my members. And um, we had, uh, had the theme of anxiety. So that was very interesting. And of course, a lot of people have suffered more anxiety due to, to COVID as well. Absolutely. So um, I think it sounds like you take a lot of knowledge from your patient group and the people that care about them and then try to feed that back to sort of the needs and, and incorporate that into your your center there is that sort of accurate yes i think so i i, I just i i think i take quite a lot of my teaching experience in, into into my work there because i think it's important to to learn and um understand and appreciate things um you know, in, in a safe environment, really, you know, and you know, that's what I always try to engender in my classes. And it's what I try to engender here. There are times when I, I tell a joke and or like graced with this blank faces, the face of Parkinson's and you think, well, that one didn't go down too well. But then I realize there's nothing to do with that. It's just that these, 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 these people didn't really come for this. They, it, it, it it's just, I don't know. I, I, I love these people. I, I, I have as my members. They're fun. They're nice. They're kind, and they, they, they don't cause me any trouble. <laughs> Lovely. That's awesome. Um, so there's been a few comments here. One is that if we could, uh, Lauren says, if we could get to med students early, when the time comes for them to be giving a PD diagnosis to their patients, they can give the diagnosis with some hope, and not just meds and an appointment for a few months out. Um, and then someone else, uh, George says, but my PD was mild then and different from now, 22 years hence. It helps mostly to know what to do, like exercises, et cetera. Have you guys been able to, I know, I saw a little bit of this on something that I was reading. Um, I mean, I think it's great to have that first steps program that's sort of, you know, the patients get referred to to learn about this on a weekend. But then have you been working at all with clinicians, I know outside of the medical students, right? But that's pretty early. We don't know how many of them are actually going to be doctors or neurologists or Parkinson's disease doctors eventually um, to, to help them give the diagnosis in maybe a, a, a way that you guys are able to give feedback around? Well, it's, it, you know, you've got to be quite, quite um, subtle. You know, uh, you, you don't want to come down like a crashing piano. Um, but it is, it is, I think it is important for, for, for uh, clinicians to realize that the method in which they, they tell you, you know, they're telling people these things every day, but we hear it once 
And that once is really, really um, pivotal. And so I, I think it is, it is important. But so, so what I've tried to do is to sort of say, you know, well, there are ways of asking questions. So you don't say to somebody, well, you know, you know, we drool, as you know, or some people drool and have excess saliva. So you can't think, well, do you dribble? You know, if you were to say, I see you wiping your mouth. Is your pillow sometimes dry, uh, wet in the, damp in the morning? So it's actually asking people in a more subtle and gentle, um, more understanding way. And I think you'll, you'll get more information from a patient asking uh, gen in, a, in a gentle, uh, respectful manner rather than you know, rather bluntly telling you, you know, asking you something. Interesting. Okay. Well, point taken. Um, a couple of other things that you said um, in, in the video, I think I watched the video of you. I can't, I can't remember if that was the video of you getting the honorary degree. It was a ceremony, which That's everyone cool. was quite posh and dressed up in some cool outfits. <laughs> But um, I know you did get your, you have two honorary degrees either coming to you or you've gotten um, sort of through your work uh, in the community there, which is amazing. But there was two things that you, that, that had been mentioned in the introduction. One was the fact that you really um, have worked at collaborating and partnering across all the agencies and support groups. So it's not just about your one support group and its success. It's just really about collaboration. I've been really, you know, um, wanting to stress that. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've done well here is to arrange this Zoom platform and I've been sharing, you know, sort of the interface and welcome anybody and everybody from around the world, um, you know, to help uh, us to connect with everyone, you know. Um, but I think it doesn't make sense to try to silo ourselves or to compete with each other, especially since we're all hoping to, you know, end Parkinson's disease ultimately. So, so um, tell us a little bit about how you've been able to keep that at the forefront of your work. Um, well, the uh, um, I became aware that the many of the members of my group belonged to. Uh, groups called PD Warriors, which are, is, is, a, is a form of exercise, it is circuit, circuit training. It's quite um, rigorous. But there are a lot of you know, quite elderly people in my group who couldn't possibly have done that. Even getting to a class like that would have been terrifying. So I said, uh, what I really need is something that's not quite as rigorous, but is actually going to exercise people in a structured manner on a regular basis rather than a six week blast, so to speak. And so uh, by approaching the uh, um, NHS Physiothera Physiotherapy Service and Age UK Oxfordshire, which is, a, 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 I think that's self-explanatory, um, we, we combined and, and they have the expertise in their charity. And so we now have something called Big, Bold and Balance. And it's just so popular. And we've now got it over six different uh, localities in Oxford. It's not just in, in one locality, but in six different localities. Because Oxford is actually, Oxford is actually quite a, a large county. And so having um, that sort of collaboration meant there's a, we've already got a link. And I think building bridges is very, very important. So we've got, now got a link with these charities. So we, we've got a, a common language really that about what we want to sort of how we can develop it so it developed that developed into um uh, into a dvd that we've now produced for them so so members if they can't come to a class have got a dvd they can rely upon and those classes now have been zoomed since the beginning of april we haven't had us we haven't had a break yet mm -hmm. at all this poor sarah is amazing and she just comes up, she says, hello, hello, hello. She said, oh, it's lovely to see you all. And think, <laughs> oh, these blank faces, you know, <laughs> all old. And she's all young and sprightly. But she, she knows exactly how to, to keep us going. So tell us a little bit about, because um, I, I know that you have incorporated your husband in some of the work that you're doing um, and uh, wanted, wanted to learn a little bit about, you know, your family and its involvement in sort of your, um, the work that you're doing and also, you know, involving them in, in as as people who, who care about you. Yeah. Well, t when I was first um, chair of the, of, the, of the group, my husband, Jonathan, was working away from home. And so he couldn't come to any of my meetings. And then when, when he could come, I said, well, will you come? 
and as soon as he did come, he could see there were some jobs he could do, one of which was to keep it, get a, a good audio system going. So he's been helping a lot on the technical side of, of setting up a meeting so that we've got the best technology we can possibly do, which is quite limited in a, you know, when you've got a, a two hour spot in a hall. Uh, so he helps in that way, but he also helps in, in the charity aspect of it in the, the uh, fundraising. So we have the Oxford Walk every year and he helps with that and he we sort of monitors that quite closely. But he also helps when I do fund, one of the fundraising events that I use, cream teas. Cream teas are very, very popular, but and it, they're even made more popular because of Jonathan's homemade scones. So he <laughs> made 120 scones one day. He said, I don't want to see another scone, you know. <laughs> and my grandsons were also helping as well. So <laughs> there was, was some quite misshapen scones when they got hold of it, but uh, it was fun. So- You have to share uh, that. It, 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 it does become a family affair. My, one daughter's just relocating back from living abroad. So she hasn't sort of had a chance to, 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 to join in the fun, but uh, my other daughter who lives locally, has been a great help and and uh, washing up and my grandsons too. That's amazing. Um, I think uh, so. We're going to get to Jane in, in just a second. Um, one or two last points that I wanted to talk about, um, Sally, and I wanted before we end up sort of with your little piece. Um, you mentioned one quote: um, "Behind every number uh, in a statistic um, in research, there is a real person living with Parkinson's disease." Could you explain sort of what you meant by that? I mean, I think it's kind well, of obvious. That's a quote that I we we had a, a we were doing a um, a study with the the CCG the the Clinical Commissioning Board um, group here in Oxford and about what services there were available for people with um with with Parkinson's and the numbers were just being banded about and that numbers are being banded about and more numbers and I went look. In the end, I just said that. I just said, look, behind every number, there is a real person. And, you know, I'm only one. You know, I was the, I was the only patient representative on this big board of clinicians and, and, you know, powerful people. And I just said, I'm the only one here, but I'm representing all the people with Parkinson's. And everyone in that number is a person with real needs, real doubts, and real fears. And can actually still offer something to society. So please remember that. That's amazing. And can you possibly just end with, I don't know if you remember the quote from um, Christopher Robin um, from the Winnie the Pooh book, but maybe if you do, um, and if you don't, we, we, could, we could collect it for you, but I'd love to hear you say it. I think it was something, oh gosh, you already. We can, we can send it, we'll put it in, in the side here, but, um, but it was such a cute quote, we'll, we'll find it. So, <laughs> but um, thanks so much. That was amazing. So, um, so we wanted to introduce Jane here next. Um, Jane is amazing. She's um, uh, maybe Jane. You could tell us a little bit about your um, uh, mission as well, and um, we can. I don't know when we should play the video, but uh, um, you're uh, you're a person who lives with a person with Parkinson's, um, and you have been tremendously. Um, uh, an advocate um, in that realm, as well as the GDNF uh, story as well. So maybe could you teach us a little bit about your journey into um, sort of being married to somebody with Parkinson's and then um, how you became sort of uh, involved uh, in, in this GDNF cause as well. And, and um, you, you had sent some quotes and we'll, we'll also play the video in a second. Certainly. Hello, everyone. And um, thanks for inviting me. It's a, it's a big privilege to be here. Um, I just want to say, Sally, you're an absolutely wonderful woman. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have met you. Um, the lady is so funny. I, I, I just can't even tell you. Anyway, um, my name is Jane um, and I met my now husband, Darren, in uh, 2009. Um, he was seven years into his Parkinson's journey in that way, and he was in a terrible way uh, emotionally. Um, he was an incredibly clever, is, I should say, an incredibly clever, very astute businessman. Um, but um, he had really struggled with his diagnosis. I think it, it basically stopped him in his tracks with life. And 
um, he went through a messy breakup as, as I did. And um, we kind of, we believe that we're soulmates. We were meant to, to meet each other really. Um, so um, I was immediately struck by his vulnerability. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose, in the in the world we always say there's there's two types of people there's givers and takers and if i'm happy just giving um so ultimately it was just what can i do to give support to this man um i had had a career in hr 24 years working for um a uh, food retailer and um, but do you know what in that 24 years i never came across one person with parkinson's I didn't have a clue about Parkinson's. I didn't realize that he had Parkinson's when I met him. I thought maybe he'd been in a car accident or he was dragging his leg and it just didn't, didn't bother me in the slightest. But, but over the years, it's something that I've reflected on a lot. And I just feel that um, people with Parkinson's, they tend to keep their, their lives very, very private. And I think a lot of that is because they worry about employers and um, what, you know, where they'll be gotten rid of if they announce that they've got Parkinson's. But um, I, I have to say, it, it still shocks me now that in 24 years of being an HR manager, and sometimes I was leading teams of 800 people, I never once came across one person. Um, anyway, so um, I think um, without doubt Parkinson's has taken a, a toll on Darren and I over the years. I am a, I'm a person living with Parkinson's. I'm not his care partner. I'm his wife and I, I'm really passionate about that. I have my own identity. Um, but do you know what? We both live with the disease. He carries the symptoms, but I... I um, I live with Parkinson's on a daily basis and it, it does take its toll. I think in terms of anxiety and stress, I've probably put on um, a weight gain of about four stone in the last six years. And not everybody will have the journey that, that Darren and I have had with Parkinson's and the, the um, clinical trial that he went on. But um, it, it, it definitely has an impact on you emotionally. I think stress-wise, I worried constantly about him, um, and I'm I've I've given up work now. I work from home, um, so I don't go into the office any longer, and I'm much more comfortable. I'm I feel much more in control um, with him being around, just so I can tap into him when whenever I need to, or just know that he is safe. Really, so I think that um, that that impact on your well-being is it shouldn't be underestimated and we very often don't talk about the stresses of the the, the family members that live with Parkinson's um, I can remember my mum saying when I first met Darren gosh you're, you're going to take on a man who has Parkinson's and I was just like well yes it just wasn't a, an issue for me at all um, and I think educating the family has been a really big piece I think Darren's family and my family neither of them um, knew much about disease progression so helping them to understand um, about what what steps he is going through and actually a lot of the um, signs of Parkinson's aren't the motor symptoms but they're the non-motor symptoms and I think you have to live with somebody to understand what those motor sim those non-motor symptoms are. Um, and so, you know, sleep deprivation being a huge one for, for Darren. I don't sleep because he doesn't sleep. Um, so we share that. And, and actually that can be quite tiresome during the day when you're both tired and um, pushing the barriers. So it's important for the other family members to know that, that actually we're not getting a lot of sleep and, you know, they need to be a little, little bit patient with us if we're a bit stressed out. Um, how did you actually, before you go on, how did you actually make that um, communication happen? Because I think that's, you know, a really good point that educating, you know, the, the, the rest of the family is important. Did you sit them all down? Did you talk to them individually? Did you talk to them together? Like, how did you go about that? 
I think it was the the individual conversations that mattered and, and meant the most difference. So I think when people started to realise that I was quite happy to talk about it openly, Darren was quite happy for me to talk about it openly. So they could then, you know, it was almost like it was a taboo subject. And up until the point that we opened up and started talking about it ourselves, it was a case of everyone was treading on eggshells and nobody really wanted to, to start any of those conversations. I think um, educating was huge. I knew nothing. So for me, in order to be able to try and get some control with, with the Parkinson's, I needed to know as much as I possibly can, could. So learning, um, you know, going online, chatting with other people, with families, um, related to Parkinson's and researching was just really important for me and then once I'd got that kind of background knowledge then educating the family around what does that look like and reassuring or um, or on the other side actually being quite brutal about you know our limitations and and him needing to take a bit of a break or don't bring the grandchildren around because I don't want him getting a, a, a cold or you know so um, the grandchildren I have four, um, and they've grown up with um, Grumpy. They call him Grumpy, um, not because he is, because he's hysterical with the, the, the grandchildren. But they, it was Grumpy initially, and they couldn't say Grumpy, so they ended up with Grumpy, and he <laughs> loves it. <laughs> um, How cute! Yeah, it's lovely. And you know, the 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 biggest privilege for me is being able to educate the children because I know that they will go into schools and grow up living with somebody who has Parkinson's, have a better understanding, and it'll make them better people as a result of that. I don't think we do anywhere near enough education. And Sally's First Steps yeah. program, um, I don't think it should be just in Parkinson's UK, it should be rolled out through the government, and it, it should be that clinicians give to um, their Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's patients when, when they're giving them their diagnosis and just helping to go away and start that education piece. Because I'm sure that first few years is the worst possible situation when you think, oh my God, what is this all about? And, and a lot of people tend to put their head in the sand and don't face into it. And I don't believe and until you actually start facing into it, you start to embrace the things that you really need, which is the, the core exercise, the eating healthily, um, you know, the, the brain training. All of those things are absolutely crucial right from the off. So there's some questions here, um, Jane. I know we have a lot to cover, but I think some of these are quite important because um, I think people have really tuned in today to learn a bit about the family you know, kind of dynamic here and how to kind of get the family members um, in, as part of the conversation. So um, uh, one is um, asking about, uh, is, is the, uh, w were you worried that the grandkids and the kids were going to, um, you know, start to worry about things um, to tell them that Grampy is sick or Grumpy is sick? I mean, how did you go about that conversation? Because especially, I don't know, what, what, what age did you, tell the grandkids um, about their grandpa? So, I mean, we just drop uh, Parkinson's into every conversation. So if he's struggling and he's in a chair, um, then, you know, we'll say, well, Grumpy needs to rest for a little while because his Parkinson's has kicked in or he's off his medication now. Look, see, Grumpy's tablet has worn out. We don't, we don't count Darren as being sick. I, there's also a he's not sick. He's he's he's, um, he's just got Parkinson's <sighs> symptoms. So you know it, it's about helping the children to recognise what those symptoms are and to learn and understand that they need to take a step back uh, to allow him to um, to relax while he's coming off his meds and going on to his meds. Um, and actually, you know, when the, the Parkinson's um, clouds over and the, the mask comes on. Um, and, and it's just helping them to understand that actually Grumpy is probably happy inside, but um, actually um, you're not seeing that on the outside at the moment because that's a symptom of Parkinson's. So it's, it's about educating in a happy way rather than it being a somber conversation. Um, and certainly sometimes his, his, um, his stiffness has hit his right side, so he starts to limp, and they'll say... Um, 
grumpy if you hurt your leg and, and he said yeah well that's my parkinson's you know so it's just how many times a day can you say you've got parkinson's and show a different symptom so that they're just learning gradually yeah it's such a complicated kind of state because people can go through these sort of you know it's so variable there's sometimes where people look like they can do anything and then other times where they may look fine physically but not feel well and then non-motor also plays into it and i think similarly as a care partner person living with parkinson's um it's it becomes hard for people to understand your piece of it and kind of what you're going through and i think there's sometimes a tendency to there's sometimes a stigma, sometimes sort of a, a sense of needing to withdraw to not make it uncomfortable around the family, but then you end up becoming isolated and it ends up becoming a worse situation. So it sounds like you really feel that the First Steps program kind of helped with, you know, getting more educated and empowered. And I don't know if there are other resources maybe. And, and also it's amazing that you have this um, human resources background. So perhaps, you know, some of that training to do that job has helped you a little bit with, um, you know, you know, Definitely. making modifications and, you know, teaching people how to work, you know, together I, in certain environments, I'm assuming. So, so maybe um, you could speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, what, what do you think have been resources that you, you've found helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the piece of getting people to engage, to help people come out of themselves, um, to, to help people talk about their Parkinson's from a family member, there's some, some really important points there. And there's, um, there's also the, um, the stigma that, um, you know, as a, as a person living with Parkinson's, you see your husband or wife, the, the person with Parkinson's, um, maybe they've got a tremor or and, and maybe they've spilled a cup of coffee or, um, or maybe they've, um, you know, um, they've got dyskinesia and, and they're, you know, all over the place. Well, for me, um, I can see the embarrassment on the care partner's um, face as if it's, you know, an awful thing um, and they've got to pick up and, um, and uh, apologise for the person with Parkinson's and it's literally the worst thing that you can do. Um, to actually apologise, absolutely, we've spilled a cup of coffee, sorry, it's a symptom of Parkinson's, um, unfortunately that's the way it is, because I, I, I just don't think that that person should be made to feel bad because they've spilled a cup of coffee just because they've got Parkinson's. It is a fact of life and, you know, we're not, we're not all 100%, we're not all able bodies and we're not all perfect. And, and actually, it's another opportunity to educate. And I really do think that. Um, I think this whole piece of bringing it out into the open, um, talking for the person who's living with that person, to, putting, putting their um, skills into practice, I think is absolutely crucial. For the person living with Parkinson's, there is a really important role to play. And that, that role is about observation. It's about um, checking constantly. What, what, what is it that you're feeling, love? How, how, how is that impacting you? Um, you know, I can see you're not, you're not great today. What is it that isn't great today? All of those points and then partnering that person to go to their clinician um, or their neurologist is absolutely crucial. We get in the UK, um, at most, we get one hour twice a year. So if we get two appointments with our um, neurologist, then you know, you've done really well. And during that one hour, it's really important to be very specific about what the person with Parkinson's is going through. The UPDRS scoring does not tell you, the clinician, anything. Like Sally said, it, you know, there is never a discussion about turning over in bed or how, how, you, how is your dexterity affecting your job, Darren? You know, are you able to use a, a screwdriver? Can you go out on your pontoons um, because um, he has a mooring business? Um, how's your balance? It, you know, those sort of things come through on a UPDRS score, but they're not important. The UPDRS to the patient is not important. It might help you understand with your tablets, but actually, in terms of asking diff a totally different set of questions, we'll get a completely different set of answers. 
And I do believe that is where the person living with the person with Parkinson's can know all of those really crucial things down and make a point of sharing them when they go to the clinician. Absolutely. I mean, I think that we've talked a little bit about this on this series is like having some sort of checklist, uh, kind of uh, uh, something to, to take with to the appointment to really be able to distill down the main things that are really troubling our patients. And often it's um, these non-motor issues and things, um, you know, so yeah. I think, uh, so just to echo a few of the comments here, one is that um, Gloria says, well, my husband's ashamed of me and apologizes for me. It does feel terrible. And it's true. Usually no one cares. He makes a bigger deal of it. So I think that is to your point. Um, people are talking about radical acceptance. So radical acceptance, transparency, it's, transparency is scary at first, but ultimately makes the coping process uh, much easier repressing emotions, discussions about PD, keeping it a secret is uh, creates a heavy burden. And I've seen that in some of my patients too. The ones that keep this a secret and living alone with it, even from their, you know, their person that they live next to day in and day out, or, you know, sometimes I'll have, you know, a patient, I'll ask them if they have kids. I've never seen any of these kids. You bring the child in and it's actually kind of a relief for the child to say, you know, this is the first time we've actually ever talked about my dad's disease because he's never wanted to share this with me. And then right. it's like a sudden conversation. But even as clinicians, we are not too sure exactly how to bring these um, conversations about. Um, Anna asks about, um, Anna Maria, any thoughts on how to talk to teenagers and their um, their dad when their dad symptoms become more complex? I don't know, is Sally or, or Jane? Any thoughts, Sally? Well, my, my grandsons are all wonderful. They, they just say, you know, they hear my ding-a-ling-a-ling on my phone, which is my alarm, and they go, oh, pillar clock. Pill o'clock time, Nan, and they go and get, go and get my pills for me and deliver them to me. It's really wonderful. But um, something I've done is a more serious, which is I've produced this paper, which is about uh, about preparing to go for your annual cons consultation, and with a, a lot of um, discussion and and uh, with with people with Parkinson's, I know that they go there and they want to put on a good show. So when you're doing that, you've got to have the facts neat and concise. So if you've got it all written down, you can just blather it out. And then when you've got something to say to you, it's important. So I've got something about medication, mobility, um, exercise, emotions and mood and lifestyle. And then some sort of more clues down on, on, on the back page. And people have found that really useful. It just gives them an, an aid memoir and they can prepare for their visit. Which is which is important, but really the um, the symptoms that we have are fit under these three main things of tremor, bradykinesia, and rigidity. And just it's how it's translated, it's translated yep. into what you're doing. Like I at one point was quite distressed because I couldn't roll pastry. I mean, it sounds a ridiculously stupid thing, but I couldn't do it. And the, but the, but the next time I went, I'd had a change of my medication. And my neurologist has said, how's, how's the patient be rolling? And it's just, <laughs> it really is a relaxant and it's, 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 it's wonderful. That's amazing. Um, yeah, people want to get a copy of your list in all capitals. If there's any way that we could share that around, we would love it. And we are trying to help. I'll charge. <laughs> <laughs> That would be amazing. Um, yeah. Jane, do you want to speak to that um, question about the teenage thing, if you have an idea as well? Well, my, my grandsons laugh at my writing. They just say, you should see Nan's writing. You see, you can't read it. <laughs> but they don't mean it in any derogatory way. It's the way I've told them. I said, yeah, I know I can't read a shopping list. I know, you know. But it, they, they do know. They know more than you realise. My, my grandsons can tell me, tell people things about my Parkinson's that probably I haven't even being aware of, or that, you know, and they, they know I've shrunk a bit because I've broken two vertebrae because of falls. And uh, so they did, oh, little, little, little nan now, isn't it? You know, and you, know, they, 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 you can't reach that top, so I can't get there. But they're very, very, they, they, they try so hard to be one step ahead of me so that I don't, you know, overstretch myself in, in many ways. That's sweet. <laughs> I don't know about James. I do. I do think that um, also with the the teenagers, they're 
um, they tend to internalize. So, um, so actually, um, if the person with Parkinson's doesn't enjoy talking about their Parkinson's, I think it's really important for the person living with Parkinson's to actually um, say, well, you know, you own your part of the disease, but I own the other part of the disease because I live with you. So I'm a person living with Parkinson's in my own right. And that actually gives me the right to speak out about how I feel about your Parkinson's. And I think by constant talking about it and keeping it out there in the open, it actually does breed confidence. Um, so, and, and, and then once it's an open subject rather than a taboo subject, um, it's constantly reassuring the youngsters that it's okay to ask questions. So, you know, if, if dad is dribbling or, um, you know, mum has a, a, a terrible cough at the moment, is that part of a Parkinson's symptom or you know do we have to be more careful in in the house i think it's just keeping it on the agenda constantly actually normalizes um the whole situation because we have to live and you can have a, a wonderful great life with parkinson's but it's about embracing it and i think until the whole family embraces it um that person with parkinson's doesn't have an easy ride i think that we can make the ride much easier by all of us working with it together. Absolutely. I mean, I think if you aren't also able to care for yourself, um, Jane, you know, uh, or Sally's husband making the scones there. Uh, I, I want the scone recipe, by the way. You guys are making me hungry with all the Jaffa cakes. And I, I, I grew up in Canada, so we had a lot of that stuff. Uh, so I'm missing all of that. But, you know, I mean, I think part of the discussion also has to include your wellness and your health, you know, Jane, because I think that, and I think sort of being able to talk even openly with family, um, you know, is, is part of that, you know, is to give you support and so that you, people know that you might need, you know, break and you might need some, you know, respite and, you know, cause if we don't take care of our, you know, carers, then, you know, what am I going to do for my patients is so, so much of what I try to have a dialogue around. But, you know, I think sometimes there's this need for patients to keep it all bottled up. They don't want to even share with the person that comes into the visits with them. So they're, you know, sometimes the, the, the person there is like hearing some of the stuff for the very first time. Um, yeah. And then other times it's just the dyad of the, t the couple that's sitting before me and everybody else in the world is shut out. And it's like, yeah, no one else let in to help and even though there's people who are willing to so i think um this is crazy how quickly this this went by i know i knew i, I already knew like with, with the avengers in general that this was not going to be easy to cover two stories and and i think <laughs> your um you know your your help uh to to teach us jane as well um as as a care uh care partner care 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 person living with the uh, parkinson's as well is so helpful um so maybe you could just speak to um because i do want to give um some of our family members out there um how do you jane take care of yourself in the sense of, you know, not feeling guilty about taking that time? Because it sounds like you are doing a little bit of that. And maybe you could give some inspiration um, to our, um, you know, people living with uh, Parkinson's, uh, uh, you know, patients, a, a little bit of inspiration to help them take care of themselves as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for me, it is about um, owning the situation. I have, uh, well, I mean, we won't we won't go into detail about GDNF, but when Darren went into the um, to the research part, he wanted to do something positive with his Parkinson's, um, and that's you know that's all credit to, to him. Once he once he came out with his Parkinson's, it was right. What can I do with this illness that I can help others with? Once we'd got to to that point, I found my anxiety levels went through the roof in terms of I lost control of. Um, my own confidence because um, he was doing things like having brain surgery and entering this clini clinical trial and being part of the, um, the testing for the safety of the device that was going in for brain surgery. And I felt completely out of control because it wasn't even like we'd had a conversation about it. It was just like one day he came home, I wasn't able to go to his appointment and it was just like, right, Jane, this is what I'm, I'm doing. The out of control piece for me um, was really difficult. And I, I reached out to a couple of my colleagues in work um, and shared. Um, and they actually helped me by saying, you know, let's talk about this journey. Let's, let's um, huddle with um, the colleagues at work and let's educate them and get, get you 
um, talking about it so that actually they are understanding of your situation as well and hopefully that will help other people as well as helping you. I found that talking it out was a huge benefit for me um, and then becoming a patient advocate um, was the best way for me to do that. So um, with the trial and, and the results of the trial being negative but having such a great disparity with the patients who were all saying, well, this is a wonderful drug, it absolutely works, and the trial not being, then um, the participant group forming, um, being able to lead that participant group has been the saving of me without any doubt, because it's given me a reason to champion the course. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw on the, uh, we didn't show the um, video, but we, Darren, he had just wonderful, wonderful results from, from GDNF. And um, I think when you've had a piece of that and you want it back, um, and then you realize the whole world around you is all, you know, there's, there's 10 million people with um, Parkinson's, um, and then their families on, on top. You, you need to unite, you need to do something about it. That's where PD Avengers came in for me because I had all of this stuff going around in my head with this group of 42 participants and it wasn't until I started branching out um, and chatting with other people online that I suddenly realized oh God, we're all saying the same thing um, but we're all in silos we're all in hundreds and hundreds of different little Parkinson's groups and we're all running around in circles and not actually achieving a huge amount it's like all this debate goes on, whereas PD Avengers, um, they're setting out to actually deliver momentum, one voice, um, three fantastic um, objectives. The research uh, objective for me just floats my boat completely. And I think I've just gone from strength to strength, really. So I've really embraced Parkinson's. Um, I gave up my role as HR. I still use those um behavioral skills um to um strengthen my cause really um and now i'm going to join a therapeutics company um which is up and coming um and i'm going to get the patients in there right at the very heart um so i have just a burning passion for the patient voice making such a big difference with parkinson's now so i just think if, if not me then who that's amazing. I mean, I think Carol puts it well. Um, lately, I've been thinking that talking about Parkinson's gives it power. We have started to talk about success as in wellness instead while not putting our heads in the sand. So I think that, you know, raising the voices, collecting the collective that's global, that I think the sort of COVID-19 sort of silver lining that everyone sort of stopped in their sort of normal day-to-day -day running around and is sort of focused um, possibly on this cause. And so I think it's just miraculous that you guys have you know joined together such an amazing group of people honestly with each of you has so much to give and, and is giving um and so i really see this momentum building sally i'm not going to let you off the hook uh, you can just close us out with a final you know um inspiration well, word, word or two of, an, of inspiration to the group and this okay. hour went by way too quickly jay and i so apologize that we didn't listen to your ggnf store but maybe we can have you on back again um and we can talk about that we'll link sure. some of the videos and stuff but i think some of the insight that you gave just around the family dynamic and and sort of this the place um you know the family members and understanding the educational piece for them has been hugely transformational i think for some of the people on this call so i really appreciate that sally I'll give you the, the do's and don'ts. I've got a the do's and one don'ts. Whole, whole big sheet of paper here. Oh boy, okay. And, I'm not going to read it all. The, the, okay. Have no fear. But I do think there's one or two things that I would tell people about living with Parkinson's and that you manage it well, avoiding the bad bits that might make them miserable. Because you don't, you don't want to make people miserable. And another thing is push the regret that you can no longer do things behind you. It's heavy baggage to carry. And I think there's so often, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can no longer do this. I think, you know, let it go, let it go. It's got to go, really. And then always remember, you've got to have a good laugh, especially at Parkinson's. You see, I go to a pub and I love a pint of beer, but I can't have a pint of beer because I shake the top half out. So I ask for half a pint of beer in a pint mug. 
Honestly, I do that. You know. But the last thing, which is, which is don't, don't give up. And you ask for the quote from Winnie the Pooh, allegedly, from, I think it might be from the film actually, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Thank you. Thank you both ladies, amazing, amazing. Um, Thank you. Each of these are so like touching, honestly. I feel like I'm gonna cry at the end of these. <laughs> anyway, uh, you guys blow my mind um, on every level. It's so sweet. Um, Gloria says, you're both amazing women, not enough female voices in this space and you were lovely. Great to spend some time with you. So we'll definitely have you back because you have so much to share. Hopefully we can get that list off of you too, Sally. We have so many things that you need to link. And then um, Jane, you'll have to link some of your GDNF resources as well. And we'll have you both back because you, you're very spectacular. So thank you for sharing the time yeah. and joining us. Um, so much to talk about, so many female voices to share. Um, Andrea, I will leave it to you for a good goodbye wave. So Jane and Sally, we always show our gratitude to our guests with a wave. And worse. We have to send our energy all the way across the ocean to you. Uh, so thank, thank you. you for joining us. Um, and everyone have a great day. It was lovely to, to see your questions and your chats and spend this time together. Thank you.